Good morning. It's good to see you all with us, especially our visitors. You're an honored guest here in our assembly this morning. If you did happen to have a chance to get a welcome packet uh, this morning, the, our deacons will be more than happy to help you with that on the way out. And be sure to fill out that visitor's card so we can just thank you for being here this morning, for honoring uh, us with your presence. And if we can help you in any, any spiritual way, well, you have a Bible question or a prayer need, or maybe you've never heard the gospel and you, you want to study that. You would, uh, you would, if you would give us the honor and privilege of sitting down with you and able to help you in that way, we would love to do so uh, this morning. Um, if you all open your Bibles, uh, be making your way back to 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we're going to be at this morning. And as you're turning there, I just want to make a couple of mention of two, two things, really. Uh, first is, it was my fault. Uh, it's on the extended prayer list, but I, I failed to put in the bulletin. Uh, please keep Morgan Staples in your prayers as he's getting ready to have a procedure done tomorrow on the 2nd. Be praying for him. Uh, that will go well. It's a, a fix something there. And just keep him in your prayers tonight and tomorrow. Um, Rebecca was saying he's a little stressed about it, which I, I understand. Uh, and so let's be praying for him. And secondly, I just want to emphasize again what our elder Kurt said this morning. We had an excellent gospel meeting this last week. All the lessons are online. And I want to stress to you all, um, those who are not widows and shut-ins and those who have issues that prevent them from coming, if you were not able to attend, uh, you missed out. You really did. And uh, to those who you were able to attend or watch online, we thank you for that. Uh, between the in-person numbers and online numbers, we are breaking 100 just about every night. And we had a lot of good visitors from the community. And keep in mind, we have the next one coming up in February, and that'll be here before you know it. Uh, it'll be another excellent meeting. I've heard David before uh, when I was about 15, and those lessons still have made an impression upon me, and I'm looking forward to hearing him. But our brother Mark read for us this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 through 10. The verse we want to focus in on this morning is verse 10, where Paul, the Apostle Paul writes there, For godly sorrow produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world brings about death. We want to talk about what godly sorrow is this morning. And we, we're going to start off this morning by looking at what, what is worldly sorrow to begin with. I know we're kind of doing that out of order, but I think it's sometimes it's helpful to understand what something is not before we figure out or go to define what it is. This is, I think, a very important verse because Paul, to set the context of a reading, he's writing to Christians. He's not talking about the repentance uh, uh, that precedes salvation, although it's of the same kind, but the, the type of repentance that all Christians are to be engaged in. You know, we, we live a life of repentance. You know, we don't always get it right, and there's times where we need to change our minds, and we need to change direction. The, the Corinthians here, it kind of makes sense of the reading, Paul's saying that he doesn't regret that he wrote to them to deal with their sins. He does have some regret that it troubled them so much and it afflicted their conscience and he made them sorrowful. He's not sorry he wrote the letter. He's just a little upset that they were so taken aback and pained by that letter. But he rejoiced in the fact that they acted accordingly on how they ought to, that they dealt with the sin. Because he says again there that godly sorrow worketh repentance that produces a salvation without regret. But the God, ungodly sorrow, the sorrow of the world, works only death. And so, starting off with worldly sorrow, we, we find out that it's actually worldly sorrow, that it's, its defining characteristic is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. As I mentioned in the Bolton article, basically worldly sorrow, you're not sorry that, well, about what you did. You're sorry you got caught. Or you're sorry that you don't like the consequences. I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 18. I know we're not there in our study just yet, but in Revelation chapter 18, I want us to note the sorrow of the worldly leaders and the people here in this part of the, of, of the vision, their type of sorrow over Babylon. And I want you to know why they're sorrowful. They're not sorrowful because of any noble cause. They're sorry, well, well let's just read. 
Now let's read in verse 9 of Revelation 18, and I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Version in your Bible, and it reads as follows. And the kings of the earth, who committed sexual immorality and had lived sensuously with her, that is, the Babylon the Great, will cry and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the, the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for on one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will cry and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo anymore. Now, John goes into a great length of describing the cargo and the riches and the wealth of the great Babylon. But I want you to know, yeah, the, the, the kings and the merchants, they are sorrowful. But why? Well, no one's left to buy my goods. The merchants there in verse 11, they're like, no one's here to buy my stuff anymore. We're, they're not upset at the loss of life. They're not upset about the destruction or the consequences. They're not upset about why Babylon is falling. They're upset because no one's here to buy my trinkets anymore. See, worldly sorrow is ultimately sorrow over the denial of something you wanted. It's a very self-centered type of sorrow. It comes from that attitude. You know, and, and we, we look further throughout the Bible. Yes, the Bible says it results in death in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 7 and verse 10 there, but we see it results in several other things. For example, it results in bitterness. Let's look over in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17. It's not the only place we've gone to with it for about Esau, but if you look in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17, the Hebrew writer relates for us in just one verse here. Esau, when he sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge, lentils, whatever your translation says, a meal, and later he couldn't get his birthright back, he was, he was definitely sorrowful, but not over what he did. Over those consequences. Let's look at what the Hebrew writer says. For you know that even afterwards, when he, that is Esau, desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Well, preacher, it doesn't say bitterness. Well, if we go back to Genesis, which we don't have time for, if you look at a large portion of the life between Esau and his brother, there were some hard feelings there. He held on to it. Now, eventually, it worked itself out, but I want you to know that he is furious, and he is bitter, not because he forsook his birthright, but because when he won the blessings of the birthright, he couldn't get it. Which, again, tells me he didn't value that much to begin with, because if you valued your birthright, which in the ancient world meant your right to inheritance and blessing as the firstborn, you wouldn't have traded away for a measly bowl of porridge or lentils, depending, again, on your translation. But oftentimes, when we, when we engage in worldly sorrow, we end up getting very bitter at the people who are, that have caused our sorrow. Right? Think about the worldly sorrow that can happen in the workplace. Somebody else gets promoted over me. And suddenly, I don't like that person anymore. I get very bitter. So I should have got that promotion. I've been here twice as long as he has. Why did he get the promotion? What makes him great? Instead of kind of looking in the mirror like, well, why is it that a new hire got promoted over someone who's been here for eight years? That might have something more to do with me than it does the other guy, right? It creates bitterness when we engage in that worldly sorrow, when, we're, when we only are upset over the things that we didn't get to have or that we thought we should have had, but it also results in despair. Judas, for example, he was sorrowful. He was sorrowful, and here's the thing. I don't think Judas' sorrow to begin with was wrong. Judas expressed genuine repentance, but here's the catch. Judas let it turn into worldly sorrow because he let it turn into despair that was paralyzing and he made a horrible decision because of that. 
I want to remind us all, all 12 of the apostles forsook Jesus that night. Only 11 were fruits of repentance that brought back life. And Judas had the same opportunity. Judas had the same opportunity. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 1. The Bible reads, Now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and they led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw what had been con- he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver in the sanctuary and departed. He went away and hanged himself. Again, Judas, when he sees what happened, Jesus stood condemned. It it hit him of the consequences of his actions. I think he made a right choice. He said, I don't want this money anymore. Take it back. And basically the Sanhedrin just says, well, that sounds like a you problem. You can go deal with that. Now here's the big difference. Judas, like Peter, like John, like Bartholomew, like Andrew, could have gone ahead of Galilee and been ready to ask for forgiveness from his Lord. Can you imagine what a powerful apostle that might have made him not not an eloquence or anything but what story what what witness he would have had instead of paul right most of our new new testament we might be calling judas as much as we've been calling paul but again i'm playing a game of what ifs <coughs> judas let his sorrow his worldly sorrow i think that's what it turned into lead into despair and you see many examples of this today. I myself am guilty of it a time or two. I think you hear worldly sorrow and despair when you hear things like, well, you just, you just can't get ahead anymore. Systems rigged against us. They don't want you to win. Those are all lies. Don't get me wrong, there are, there are cases where individuals, yes, they have extreme circumstances. They do, or they're, they're born into poverty and so forth, and there's challenges to overcome. But guess what? If we give in to this despair mentality, it results in paralysis, and you won't do anything about it. And I, I'm, I know I'm giving workplace illustrations, but more seriously, if we end up being in despair about our sins, oh, I'll just never be able to defeat this. I just can't do it. I'm predisposed to it. Uh, Satan's got a leg up on me. We're never going to do anything about our sins. Now, there's many cases in the Bible I I thought about paralysis, what what worldly despair comes to, but, you know, case that really kind of stood out in my mind. If you want to turn to 2 Chronicles, in chapter 16... You know, of the study of the kings, this one in particular, I think, is probably one of the sadder ones. We often think about Manasseh, who repented probably a little bit too late in his life to have any good effect upon the nation. We, we might think of Josiah, who was faithful from a young age, or David, or Hezekiah. But I, I think Asa here, somebody who was so strong for so long, he sins. That's not what makes it sad, because all the kings, they had their sins. David definitely. We're going to begin to that in a couple weeks in our Sunday evening series. But what Asa did in the end, he was so upset that he got caught, he just refused ever to do anything about it. Pick up in verse 7. Now at that time, the prophet came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have leaned on the king of Aram, and not leaned on Yahweh your God, therefore the military force of the king has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians 
and the Libum and the and a vast military force with an exceedingly vast number of chariots and horsemen. Yet because you leaned on Yahweh, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of Yahweh move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is wholly devoted to him. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. Then Asa was vexed with the seer and put him into prison. And he was enraged at him for this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Now behold the acts of Asa from first to last. Behold, are they, writ, are they not written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel? And Asa became diseased in his feet in the 39th year of his reign. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease... He did not seek Yahweh, but the physicians. So Asa slept with his fathers, and he died in the 41st year of his reign. I want us to note something here that the prophet says here, uh, Hanani. That he comes to Asa, and as part of his, his campaign, Asa is now relying more upon worldly powers than he is his God. And the prophet just brings up an occasion previous in his reign, and says, were you not outnumbered by the Ethiopians? That great ancient kingdom of Aksum, who, from what we can tell, all the gold in Mediterranean came from, they were a powerhouse. It says, weren't they not more numerous than you? And yet, did you not rout them because you learned to trust your God? And I'm paraphrasing the prophet, but the prophet says, what gives? What changed? So because you have now forsaken your God, you will have nothing but wars. Now, okay, that's a fair consequence. Think about David when he did the unsanctioned census and he counted the people and God says, okay, pick from one of these three things. There's a punishment now. You can have famine, you can have plague, you pick your thing. And David's not arguing with God. He says, yeah, I sinned. Okay, um, I want the one that's going to be the least damaging to the people. David multiple times for his, lot, his reign recognized, yeah, I sinned, I messed up. Here's the consequence. What does Asa do? He shoots the messenger, metaphorically. Throws him in prison. He doesn't like what the messenger has to say. And he stayed in that bitterness. And it led to paralysis about what he was going to do with that sin. Because the chronicler, he rarely makes a moral judgment or provides commentary with events. So when he does, you pay attention. And one thing he tells us is, Asa did not seek the Lord, even in his great affliction. I will tell you, worldly sorrow, because we can have worldly sorrow over sin. All it's going to do is result in death. We might get bitter at the situation. Who's that preacher to tell me that's wrong? Why do the elders come and talk to me about this? And we can get, we, we might fall into the sin of despair. I'll never be able to take care of this sin. Paralysis, which I think is kind of the other side of the coin with despair. It's like, well, I, I haven't been able to beat it yet, so I, why worth trying? All of these result in your spiritual death and our spiritual death if we don't take care of these things. But godly sorrow, on the other hand, as the text says, as the old King James says, worketh repentance, or produces repentance, as the legacy standard version says. And I love that word repentance. Because Paul doesn't say sorrow. Sometimes we think repentance means feeling really, really, really sorry about something. No, 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 that's sorrow. Repentance is a change or a radical change of mind, thought, and action. You recognize the course you're on is not right, and you do a 180. It's, it's making the U-turn when you realize you're on the wrong road. That's what I love about driving to Arizona. U-turns are legal. Oregon. Oregon, you, don't have, you can't have any fun. No, you're, you no know, U-turns. You have to pay for all your bags at the grocery store. Anyway, but guess what? In Oregon, if I found out I'm on the wrong path, I'm like, well, there goes the rest of my afternoon because now I got to zigzag across town to all this stuff because I there's no easy way to turn around. And 
I mean, that's the joke about living in Portland. You make one wrong turn and, well, hope you have three hours to spare, but it's going to take you that long to figure out how to get back. Sometimes people treat repentance that way, you know? Instead of just making the U-turn that's so easy, we like to zigzag across town and figure out all, we try every which different way possible except God's way. That's what I love about driving down here is because, oh, I missed my, I missed the turn on Broadway. Guess what? Let me go down to the next intersection, hang a Yui. By the way, this turn lane out here gets clogged up during rush hour, so I, I dubbed it the, uh, the country club maneuver, where I just go through the light and hang a U-turn, and I can get faster to the Elcon than just waiting at the left turn signal. I can say that. I think it's legal. My insurance agent's not here, so. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Godly sorrow is that great, quick U-turn. It's that produces that repentance. And that's because godly sorrow is God-centered. We're not upset we got caught. We are upset because we have offended. And we have broken our Lord's heart. I want us to know what David's attitude is in Psalm 139. This came up in our ladies' class um, this week. In, in Psalm 139, I want us to look at David's attitude here. David's desire was to do God's will at all times. But David understood that sometimes he doesn't have an accurate picture about himself. Sometimes he has blind spots, as don't we all. And what did David pray here in, in verse 23 and 24 of Psalm 139? He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there is any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Now, what is the order here? What is the sequence? What is he praying for? God, I don't know myself as I ought to, so I need you to search me. Try every thought, see every action, and if there's any wrong way in me, please lead me away from it. That's the order of these two verses. That is a God-centered heart. That's a God-centered attitude that wants to do the will of God. And when, you, when a person like that finds out they're not doing the will of God, they want to change that. Godly sorrow comes from that God-centered attitude. I want us to note that in two sections here. First in Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Now, Romans 7 is a it's a great chapter. I think it's talking about the, the warring of the two impulses that a person has while they're not a Christian. And, but I want us to note what he says in verse 13 here of chapter 7. He, because he tells us a principle. He said, Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me. Never be, may it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to me, shown, excuse me, it might be shown to be sin by the working out of my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment sin may become utterly sinful. I know Paul's waxing eloquently here. Here's what I think he's saying. It was through God's law that I finally could come to an understanding of how utterly sinful sin is that it was God's law that pointed out to me where my shortcomings were at and how I could fix those. It was God's law that made me aware of how much of a mess I am without God. And to where, I'm just going to reference it for sake of time this morning, but in 2 Kings chapter 22, 11, verse 13, where there they find the law again, and the king hears God's law for the first time in his life read, and his response at the end is he goes on his knees and he tears his garments because he says, we are in big trouble because we're not doing any of this. And he tells the priest, like, we need, read that whole thing and tell us what we needed to be doing. Only a God-centered attitude has that kind of response. Only a God-centered heart would even care to begin with what God wants me to do. And so this list is much shorter, but we see it results in repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly sorrow worketh repentance. But in Luke 15, verse 17 as well, there's a, something I want us to look here. 
that this idea of godly sorrow produces repentance, I think is summarized really well here in the par- uh, product, parable of the prodigal son. You look in verse 17, what it says about the prodigal son, when he's in the far off country in the pig pen, it says this, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm da- dying here with hunger. Some translations say when he came to his right mind, when he came to his senses. That's what's all being meant there. That's repentance. You come to your right mind about God's law and your sin. And so the text tells us it results in salvation and life. In Acts 11, verse 18, the apostles say there that these individuals have been granted the repentance that leads to life. Because think about what happens, and we could talk at length, the physical effects sinful guilt brings upon a person. I don't mean that it's some sort of mystical type of thing. David said the day and night when he was silent about his sins, his body wasted away. Why? We read about his God-centered heart. Somebody who wants to do that will of God, staying a sin, is a guilt unlike any other. And that weighs on a person. That weighs you down into your bones on a person. And when you finally make that good confession, it's like a giant weight was taken off of you that you didn't know you were carrying. You have the life and joy that comes from repentance because you now know that you are right with your God. But sometimes, Christians don't experience that joy and peace that comes from repentance. You know, joy and peace should follow repentance. We see David in his, do, in his two great confessional psalms, written very shortly after each other. You know, he prays in Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. In Psalm 32, praying, he said, How blessed is the man whom the Lord has forgiven, whom he does not imp- impute iniquity. You have made known to me the, the joys of your salvation. But again, why is it sometimes Christians don't have that after they repent? And I speak as one this morning who's been there. And I want you to bear with me for just a minute, because this is where this uh, this sermon, I hope, gets very practical. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been praying, you've been been repenting, but... It doesn't feel right. And the first thing I would say is be careful with the emotions. They're not always an accurate guide, and our, our standing before God does not depend upon how we feel about it. Thank God, right? Amen. Um, there are bad days. But this is still a problem that many believers have. I think there's three reasons why that is. There's at least three, there's probably more, but I think there's three big ones. And the first is ignorance of what the Bible actually teaches about God's faithfulness and, and, and the promise of forgiveness for, for sins. Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who is a preacher of last century, um, his doctorate was not in theology or anything. He was a medical doctor before he became a preacher. O- on this point... He has a book called Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Solutions. And that was a series of some 20-something sermons he preached consecutive Sundays after the end of World War II. Because he noticed in the congregation which he had served, many of the members seemed to have this dark cloud hanging over them. It, it's a, to me, it's a worthwhile read. But in the chapter titled, That One Sin, He's talking about sometimes how Christians don't feel joy and peace after they repent. He offered this advice, and I think he's right. Sometimes the best thing for a Christian to do when they are not feeling the joy and peace after repentance is to stop praying for a moment. And you have to kind of do a double take when you read this, to stop praying. 
Because sometimes what we do in our prayers, and I'm guilty of it, all we're really doing is mouthing the words without actually in thinking about them. And so uh, we feel the same way after prayer that we did beginning of prayer. And he, he, he recommends, I agree, he says, stop praying for a moment and work on your doctrine. Stop praying for a moment so you can get in the Word and understand fully who God is and what He is doing and what He has promised and what He's willing to do for you. And then go back to praying. He's not talking about quitting prayer altogether. He's not talking about quitting prayer for a, a, an hour or something. Take a moment to ground yourself back in the Scripture. I want us to look at Paul here in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. And I think you'll see why. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 12, and we'll read through verse 16. Paul writes here, that he is grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who strengthened me, because he regarded me faithful, putting me into service. Even though, and I want you to know what he says here, I was formerly a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Yet, I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy saying and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. Yet for this reason I was shown mercy, so that me as the foremost Christ Jesus might demonstrate all his patience and an example for those who are going to believe upon him for eternal life. Do you highlight or mark your Bibles? I would underline example in verse 16. Paul's life, as, as he said, the chief of sinners, a man who was a violent aggressor, a persecutor of the church of God, a blasphemer, that's one who, that's speaking ill and cursing of God. That, that's what he describes his life as. I was the worst. And yet God saved me so that in my life, God could point to example to others if God saved him and used him for great good and forgave him and strengthened him and, and comforted him, you are no worse than Paul. You are, you are equally welcome to all the same blessings of the Apostle Paul as he said that Christ Jesus might demonstrate in Paul all his patience as an example for all those who are going to believe upon him for eternal life. Do you, know those who are do you know who those who are going to believe upon him are? That's you and I. Because when Paul penned that, not even our great-grandparents were born yet. They weren't, as my dad said, they weren't even a twinkle in their parents' eyes. Their, their parents weren't even born yet. God saw the need to be able to point to concrete flesh and blood examples for our assurance and our knowledge. So, if you're struggling with peace and, and joy after repentance, I would say to you, study your Bible. Go to 1 John. Does you know why John wrote that? He said it in chapter 5, that you may know you have eternal life. Not that you might, you have it. That you may know it, assuredly, factually. Study John. Study the life of Paul. Study what Christ did on the cross for you and I. But sometimes we might have the head knowledge, but sometimes we don't have the conviction about that. Unbelief might be another cause of that. And I don't mean outright unbelief. Even believers struggle with belief. Well, preacher, how does that work? You're saying I'm a believer, but I struggle with belief. Hear me out. Let's turn to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, we read about a man um, who had faith. He was convicted that Jesus was able to do what he was going to ask of him. But we see here in verses 23 and, and 24, it 
Excuse me. I don't know how that got up there. I'm going to reference it for you, and I'll, I'll correct that later. Um, so, there is an occasion in the Gospels where a man comes to Jesus with his son who is demon-possessed or has some ailment, and he says, Lord, please heal my son, if you're able to. Now, this man demonstrated belief in Jesus and faith in him. He brought his son who was possessed and afflicted and says, you were able to do this. But that one little word, if, Jesus lashes on to. If I am able. Now they exchange and says, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. There are times in a believer's life where we do have faith, but we require or we ask for more. Maybe we have head knowledge about what the Bible teaches, but it's not yet conviction in our bones. For a very many years in my early Christian life, if you were to ask me, do you know you're going to heaven? Or ask me, are you? I would say, I don't know. That's true. That would be a true statement. I, I did not know. This is the preaching I was around. I, I think to some degree, right, emphasizing the need to live by the gospel. But as a young believer, all I heard was perfect obedience. It's only been the last couple of years that now if you ask me that question, I could say to 100% certain, says, I know where I'm going. And it's not because of what I've done. It's not because of how, how good. It's because I, every day, to the best of my ability, am living in trust, trusting God, that he will deliver what he has promised. Now, that changes how I have lived. That has given more assurance to me. But, guess what? I had to work on a lot of doctrine for it to become conviction in my bones. And I would say to you, on this one, pray to God to increase your faith in these promises like 1 John 1, 9, or what we see here about how we become as convinced as, as Paul was of his salvation. But as Brother Zeke mentioned in our prayers in the meeting, our prayers got to have hands and feet. And when we pray about it, we have to act on it. See, I've, I've become convinced that belief starts with a choice, that I'm going to trust what God said. Now, I, that sounds easy. I recognize it's harder to put into practice than it is to say. But I, go, I keep going back to 1 John. But you know what the condition is there in 1 John of God forgiving us? A lot of you know that passage to say, well, our repentance. Yes, but our repentance doesn't mean anything if not for a couple of verses prior. That God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who is he faithful and just to? Himself and his promises and what he has assured us. And so it might look, I, I've, I've, I, maybe I've come to a knowledge of that verse and I'm studying, and now I need to get to conviction point. I need to act upon that promise there. And that prayer might look like, Lord, I don't, I pray to you for forgiveness, I don't feel that it's happened, but you have said it has, and I'm going to live life accordingly. But sometimes our emotions, we've got to fight against them. We do. We do. But I think that's one way you can increase your belief and your conviction there when it comes to that. And then finally, I think sometimes we don't feel the joy and peace of our repentance because we lack contemplation. Now, what do I mean by that? We all have a head knowledge of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And I will raise both my hands here this morning that I have yet to fully grasp all the implications of Christ's death on the cross for me. I understand he died for my sin. I understand it was on my behalf. I understand it's by his scourging, to quote Isaiah 53, I am healed. It's by me trusting in that. But to really think about how his death, burial, and resurrection works out in every aspect of my life, I'm not there yet. And so perhaps I need to think more deeply on the magnitude 
of that event. And one section of scripture, or two, I want to point us to. First is in Romans chapter 5, looking at verses 6 through 11. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been made right with God by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Jesus. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom now we have received the reconciliation. Sometimes I have to go back to this passage and remind me that if God was willing to die and save me, while I was his sworn enemy. That's what Paul's saying here. When we were in sin, we weren't just sinners, we were God's enemies. We were unholy, profane, not welcome in his presence. And this is how God shows his love towards his race, that while we were in that condition, he still loved us to sacrifice his son. So that these enemies could become beloved children. That's why Paul says, if we were saved in that state, how much more than now that we are his children? Thank you. Sometimes when I pray for forgiveness, and my repent, after I repent and pray for forgiveness, maybe I need to go immediately read Romans 5, 6 through 11, if I'm struggling with this. But as Matthew's gospel says in the prologue of one, chapter 1, verse 21, they shall call him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. Not some of their sins, not the ones that God only chooses to forgive, not the ones that you feel right of, that you, conv- you did enough to repent of, all their sins. I appreciate your kind attention this morning. I pray that this lesson has been helpful to those. Uh, We have a better understanding of what godly and worldly sorrow is. And I pray that when you pray about your sins as believers, when you repent of them and you pray and you confess them, that you will have more surety now and confidence that they are forgiven. If you're here this morning, and something about what we've read about Christ's death there in Romans 5 has struck you, he did that for you. Having not known you personally, but known you, in, you know, uh, before the Christian world, and you knew when you are going to come here, he, he may not have met you in flesh and blood, but he knows you, and he was willing to die for you for that. If you believe that, and you want to become one of his followers, we can help you this morning. There is water ready. We can take your confession. You can repent of your sins, and we can help you be immersed Remission of your sins in the waters of baptism, you raise a newness of life. You know, as Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. The one who does not believe is condemned. Maybe you've done that in the past. Maybe you're struggling in sin. We can help you with that. Maybe you need encouragement with prayer. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, why don't you meet me right down here at the front? as Sarah stand and sing the song that's been selected.